The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to Current Trends and Logos and How They Translate to Embroidery. Now uh, this is just a quick sound check. Uh, Jesse, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Everybody um, who has joined us so far, um, this is, if you can't hear me, you, you won't know it, but you should be able to hear me now. And so we'll, we're ready to start. Uh, where, where do logos begin and how do they turn into the impressive uh, left chest stitch out or the popular cap design that we're so used to seeing. You don't have to be an embroiderer or a digitizer to know that there must be a process, a method for translating the printed graphic you see on a business card or letterhead to a classy embroidered logo. My name is Alice Wolf. I'm the manager of education and publications for Madeira USA and we have a guest with us today who's prepared to shed a whole lot of light on this subject. Jesse Elliott is the Digitizing Product Manager at Ignition Drawing. Um, the company is known for its expertise in digitizing, and Jesse has much to share with us today. Jesse, welcome. Thank you for joining. All right, I'm going to start um, with just a couple of slides before turning the program over to Jesse. Um, in a blog, a business blog that was written by Kono Fusco, who's the creative director of Deluxe Logo Design, he points out the 20 logo trends shaping 2017. We, were, we are not going to look at all 20. Um, these are graphic design logos. They're not, um, we're not going to go into the embroidery of each one, and I'm not going to talk about all 20. But I thought that it would be, too, it would be interesting to see two slides um, on which we'll highlight some of them that you are very likely um, to be asked to translate to embroidery. So some of the current trends in logo design at the print level are letter stacking, like you see um, top left corner, the American Library Association. Um, this can be a visual challenge if there's a lot of uh, words, lettering. It grabs the viewer's attention. It's easy to absorb. It saves space, but can include lots of lettering, and it may combine initials, which are the big ALA, uh, with what they stand for, uh, which are the words that are stacked and smaller. Uh, the next one you see, the bakery, is uh, vintage. Uh, it combines modern elements with old school for nostalgia. Um, it, it's supposed to depict emotion. Uh, you hear the term shabby chic. It often includes a script font. Um, down at the bottom, drawn by hand. Uh, this is very kind of cartoonish. It lends whimsy, a sense of humor. Um, could be very effective if done for the right kind of company. And then the one, the Cotton Bureau that you see, is considered line art. It's very clean and clear. It conveys stability and elegance. It's simple. Um, and you could expect a pretty low stitch count on a, on a logo like that. Another four uh, that we'll look at, and then we'll get it into embroidery, are spot picks. Um, this is the one that you see, top left corner. Um, these are icons or very simple graphics that fit inside circles. Uh, they signify unity, community, timelessness. But with these, you have to watch for too many outlines, which can be a challenge to the embroiderer. And that is a topic that Jesse will be talking about. Next um, is use of circles and other geometric shapes. Uh, these are used in logos to simplify an overly complicated design. Very straightforward, um, often can be accomplished with a very straightforward satin or fill stitch. Uh, the next one, lower right hand corner, is uh, shield shapes. These are offshoot of the vintage trend. They represent strength and security, power and tradition. Um, they also reflect the popularity of badges and emblems, and you'll often see the company name large with a uh, subtitle beneath it, and this is something that Jesse will address as well. And finally, uh, lower left-hand corner, the use of ombre. 
that can symbolize change or movement. You see this uh, recently uh, in trends in hair and fashion um, that's carrying over into logos. And this lends itself to the shading that Jesse will talk about. And some of our threads are dyed to give an ombre effect so that you would be able to actually accomplish something like this one with a single spool. Um, you can see the source of this information down the bottom of the slide. Um, just, just very quickly, this information was found again in a blog by Kano Fusco. He's a 25-year 25, 25 veteran of designing logos and currently the creative director for Deluxe Logo Design. They employ about 10 um, graphic designers. Uh, the blog there on their website is extremely interesting, and we recommend that you might take a look to see all 20 of the shape of the trends that are shaping 2017. Um, again, it's Deluxe Logo Design. Uh, Deluxe specializes in small businesses. It itself is a $1.6 billion company. Uh, it's been around for 100 years, and yes, they are the same company that prints your checks. So uh, with that, now I'd like to turn the webinar over to Jesse, who has a wealth of knowledge to share about how to literally translate the logos that are brought into your shop into successful embroideries. Jesse? Hello. Glad to be here. Um, let me first say, um, this webinar is not about how to digitize, but more of how trends and logos can affect your deci decision making and how to better deal with designs before they even get to the digitizer. Um, most graphic designers are expensive but have the knowledge to, to determine the qualities of a good logo. They also understand different applications and how to approach them. With the advent of cheaper s software programs, um, the, DIY, the DIY approach has much more appeal, but can often lead to difficult decisions for embroiderers. The current trend is towards do-it-yourself approach. Next slide. Um, let, let's first go over uh, certain embroidery terms. Um, that we're, go we're going to go over, push and pull, density, underlay, read out, blending and shading, run stitch, double run stitch, triple stitch, fill stitch, and satin stitch. Um, push and pull compensation is um, how to deal with certain effects of embroidery. With stitches, where the endpoints are, they have a habit of sinking, and that's called a pull. And um, where, where ends like the L and the W, where it ends flat like that, it has a habit of pushing out, and hence push and pull compensation. Um, there, there are um, there is pull compensation uh, tool in most digitizing software, which allows you to increase that compensation uh, for certain fabric types. Next, density. Um, with, with density, the average density in the middle. This is what we typically do, but depending on fabric types and certain situations, you may need to adjust the density to either a lighter, which is more open, or a wider spacing between stitches, or a heavy density, which is less space between the stitches. Heavy is um, often used for fleece or towels. Underlay, we, we show uh, different types of underlay here. On number one is a run stitch underlay, where it just uh, starts at the beginning, travels to the end, then comes back, and then starts the top stitching, which in this case is satin stitch. Um, number two, same case, but it's zigzag. And so it does a run stitch all the way to the end, then comes back on itself as a zigzag, and then finally over on top of that is a satin stitch. 
Number three is a double zigzag. It's similar to number two, but it starts out with a zigzag one direction and comes back with uh, opposite points the other way. Number four, um, edge run. Um, as shown, it just goes to the edge of the design. It kind of, and this is really good to uh, change the effect of pull. Um, having that run stitch on the edge will keep it from sinking quite as much. Number five, uh, we've got a fill stitch with basically an open fill stitch as the underlay. Um, this tacks down the fabric, uh, flattens it a little bit depending on the fabric type and everything. And number six is just a finished square of what it looks like as a fill stitch. Readout um, is where fabric is used instead of thread or um, ink, you know, um, in this case, thread. Uh, as shown on the right, you've got uh, all that's black, such as the eye and the fin, is going to be the color of the shirt. Um, it's a nice effect, but it's harder to control the shapes when you do readout. Um, the shapes tend to have a, a chance of pushing out and stretching and not quite being ex exactly what you might want. Next. Blends, drop shadows and outlines. Um, uh, on the left, we show um, blending. The number one is just basically a shade of, it's a fill stitch used that has a high density on the top and low density on the bottom and graduates all the way. Number two and three are basically the two sections of a two color fill, the two color blend. Um, number two is the, the first layer, which I prefer to use dark color first. Um, light color tends to not be as visible and so creates a softer blend. So number three is a light color, so it goes on top of number two. And then finally, number four shows the finished product of the two colors combined. Um, drop shadow and outlines are pretty much obvious from the pictures shown. Next. This is a picture of a run stitch. It's also known as a walking stitch. Uh, it just simply goes from, goes one direction around um, just doing various impu inputs of a specified stitch length. Next. Double run is exactly like a single run stitch, but once it reaches the end, it goes back on itself. So it creates a slightly thicker stitch. This is what's most commonly used in most designs as a double run stitch. A single run stitch is often too thin. Next. Triple stitch goes, um, it looks like a run stitch, but basically it goes forward, then back, then forward, and forward, then back, and then forward, forward, as shown there. Uh, this creates, it's also known as a bean stitch because the look gets, uh, the thread gets fat in the middle and um, narrow at the end, at the points, needle points. So uh, it creates a kind of a bean look. This, will, uh, this shows fill stitch and satin stitch combined. Um, fill stitch is for wider areas. Uh, you have limitations with satin stitch. It can only go a certain length. Depe depending on your machine, that length changes. And um, if you go too long with a satin stitch, it becomes, uh, it trims. So you're going to need a fill stitch, which has 
inputs that become a nice pattern. Um, however, the, the drawback on a fill stitch is it can kind of lose its shape a little bit. So most often people uh, like to uh, digitize it with a satin stitch that goes around it. Jesse, can I interrupt just for, the, one, just for yeah. a second for a question that came in? Um, when would you decide to use a double run stitch? On what type of uh, double run or? stitch? Like I said, is often used in out uh, thin outlines. Okay. Um, uh, it, it's for, for outlining like like small letters that they just have to have an outline, which I don't recommend. But <laughs> um, you you'll do a double run because a, a single run can um, sink, especially like in the same same uh, direction as the fabric. If the it's got a vertical weave, that run stitch is going to sink right into it if it goes vertical. So um, a double gives it a little more thickness, so it shows up. Okay, I'm going to stop you here again uh, for a question. Uh, do you always recommend underlay? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, the only time I, I do not do a whole lot of underlay are uh, kind of twill fabrics or hat fa hats that are having a lot of movement and uh, that the movement is creating basically the satin stitch on top or the stitch type on top is not covering that underlay so you just have to get rid of it but for the most part um, underlay is recommended because it helps tack down the backing. It also um, helps stabilize the fabric, especially in um, stretchy fabrics. Okay. And is that is that even with fill stitches? Oh, yeah. Okay. And one, one more question. What setting do you recommend for the offset of a fill stitch? Um, generally, I keep the offset around 50%. Sometimes I have it go in towards the shape a little more, so like a 40-60. Um, it all depends on the thickness of the outline. Um, if it's real thin, you kind of have to adjust a little more. Um, I also take the care of trying to shape the fill stitch beforehand so it doesn't push out beyond that outline. So um, that, that's essentially it. But, but basically, uh, I keep it at 50 or 40, 60. OK, thank you. <laughs> OK, next slide. All right, um, too many outlines. Uh, on the left, we show kind of a logo that was given to us. You can see it has um, two outlines and a uh, drop shadow. And uh, this will create issues, which we'll see shortly. On the right is what I recommend of simplifying it. I, I prefer to keep things to one outline um, one or none outlines because um, movement can happen even when you're not dealing with hats. It's um, stretchy fabrics, performance wear is often going to move a lot more and stuff like that. So it's really difficult to do several outlines. The other issue is if you're doing uh, several outlines, especially all in satin stitch, it can be too many stitches in one area, which can often cause um, holes in your garment. All right, here on the left, we have a stitch out of the original logo. Um, you can see the white outline has moved quite a bit on the right of Rinky and Ground. Um, the drop shadow has pretty much disappeared from the red lines and stuff. It, it just creates kind of a messy look. So um, the more you can simplify, the better. 
such as on the right, you could clearly see the drop shadow. I pulled the drop shadow further away, so uh, it has less chance of sinking in behind the um, top letters and stuff. So it, it's a much more pleasing look. Jesse, I'm just going to jump in here for a second um, based on a question that came mm -hmm. in that you addressed um, actually very early on. Uh, this is not a webinar on how to digitize. It is a webinar on translating logos into embroidery. But in explaining that, um, Jesse will be talking about some uh, digitizing concerns. Uh, so I hope, uh, as you can imagine, it's difficult to gauge the abilities of everyone that is sitting in on, on this webinar. So uh, that's why uh, Jesse went through the terms that he'd be using. But it's if you joined us to learn how to digitize, this is not the webinar for, for you. This is more on um, looking at today's logos and seeing what kind of concerns digitizers and embroiderers should have regarding them. Okay, thank you. Um, thin details, um, here we're, we're talking about like the run stitch again, and um, this truck on the right shows a lot of detail that's not going to work well in um, embroidery. It's got the extra outlines, as you can see. It's actually got uh, three outlines, a uh, black, a uh, thin white, and orange, um, which, which can, like I said before, too many outlines can kind of not look clean. Um, they can be rough when they're together. They can also um, just overlap each other and not fit correctly. Um, with the small lettering below, um, solution can be using smaller uh, thread weight and smaller needle. Um, in this case, going the long haul with our long haul is really tiny and is going to have to be done in a run stitch but would look better with a smaller uh, thread weight um, with the truck consider eliminating some lines and we'll also show um, a version i have of where i took out a lot of detail and used stitch direction and slightly different stitch uh, color to create depth and the look of the truck without such uh, without a lot of outlines so on the left you should see all the outlines on the truck you can see the grill especially um, looks like a mess and the run stitch just doesn't look very clean um, and in this case fast since the white outline was so thin it had to be a double run stitch, and that's a good example of double run there. Um, on the right is my version of a simplified truck using the stitch direction, and um, just ask your digitizer like what they can do to some of this. Can they use stitch direction and stuff? Some, some, some aren't as good as others, so some might have a little trouble doing something like this, but it's possible. And also, uh, I forgot to mention, um, on these two pictures here, left is a 40 weight thread and on the right is a 60 weight. All right, small lettering. Um, you will often get logos that just have way too many texts. We call this um, reading a book. but. Solutions can be to enlarge the type and possibly stack it on top of each other. Um, use the smaller weight thread, such as 60 or 75 weight. Uh, another good solution is tonal or tone on tone. Um, this you can still do in satin stitch. And, but with a bright color, it's going to show all the flaws of a really tiny lettering. But when you do tonal, you'll be able to read it, but not see all the mistakes. So I highly recommend tonal if you can get away with it. Usually uh, tonal is really just like a shade or two darker or lighter than the fabric. Next. Oh, 
Okay, Th this is um, um, show showing a logo here that was given to us, um, asking for this logo on the left to be two and a half inches wide. It obviously cannot be done that small. The factory certified and weather stopper letters are just way too small. The TMs wouldn't come out that size. So um, you would have to enlarge with something like that. Um, I prefer on the right, uh, upper right, um, just to simplify it and get rid of that small lettering. Uh, other chance is to go with the smaller thread and um, double stack, uh, stack the two lines as shown on the bottom. Next. Kerning, um, it's the spacing between letters. Um, I, I went to graphic school, so I know all these annoying terms, but kerning is one. Um, on, on the upper one, you will see kerning that's way too tight. What could happen in this situation is um, the stitches can basically move the previous stitches around. If it's too close, once you do one letter and then do another, that can kind of rough up the previous letter and um, or just overlap because there's not a whole lot of space. So. Um, not space for the needles to kind of go in a separate location of the fabric so it just kind of overlaps and kind of jumbles and becomes a mess um, the middle kerning is about the spacing i prefer just a little more open and so you can't see the jump stitches like between the r and the n on the bottom we have too much spacing um, so if you're not doing trims between letters, which with small lettering, I don't recommend trims. Um, the start and stop stitches when you do trims are going to bungle up and become bigger with, and is really noticeable on small letters. So I really do recommend jump stitches as shown, but you just want that kerning to be a little narrower so they're not as obvious. Jesse, before we leave this slide, question yeah. came in about um, how do you embroider a logo that requires both thin and thicker thread? And I think that uh, this is a question that comes to us very, very often. And I think any manufacturer of thread would um, kind of say the same thing. We've learned from embroiders, digitizer friends, that very often they'll set up one needle um, on their machine with a 65.9 so that it's ready to go, usually black or white, most often black for the very small, um, like a subhead or the tagline that you mentioned earlier. So you could run your 40 and then just dedicate that one needle to the 60 weight thread. Yeah, as far as a digital Digitizing is concerned, you may want that lettering on if like say there's a black fill and black letters, put those on a separate stop. That way you can have the black fill before and 60 weight for the letters. Okay. Um, Jesse, is there another name for kerning? I mean, uh, uh, not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge either. Okay. Um. Um, Jesse, have you ever run into a, a customer who insists on trimming between each letter? Yeah, always. Um, you will see, uh, like, a, I've got a handout called Digitizing Small Letters, um, helpful hints for it, and that actually shows um, kind of where you can kind of start or end your uh, letter when you are required to have um, trims and stuff, where you start and end can really uh, 
make the difference to whether that start stitch and end stitch shows up or not. You can kind of hide it just a little bit, but um, with small lettering, it can be difficult. It can be done, but it can also be difficult. The other issue with um, trims between small letters is that you just give it more opportunity that give the machine more opportunity to um, not catch the bob and so it slows down the machine and you're going to have to rethread so it's a pain okay all right um common design issues busy complex logos um here we show a pretty complex logo really needed to be simplified there's certain swooshes and stuff that were removed or thickened and um, this is what has to be done depending on the size of um, the logo and everything there's there's certain qualities cer certain size restraints for stitches especially um, satin and fill uh, that they have they, they can only go to a certain width or limit to a certain width um, that looks good. So um, in this case, it's all narrow, but uh, if you keep all the thin strokes and stuff, you would probably have to do run stitches and look good in this design. Um, I believe you, you were going to talk about the threads on the right, the thread colors. Uh, yes, after uh, Bonnie Nielsen, who is a, a designer for Germany, uh, Madeira, Germany, uh, was faced with this challenge, she did come up with a solution. And on the top uh, right, you see one version where she used classic rayon, just the regular 40 weight um, for the center, the, the D part in the center. And then below that, she used the 50 weight metallic for a little bit more, um, I guess, pizzazz. This was a a company, an international company. I believe it's based in the UK. Okay. Uh, Jesse, a question right. uh, to you about whether you yeah. whether you build um, build in fonts that are used in your software for the small letters, or do you hand digitize? Um, I'm one of those annoying people that hand digitize everything. <laughs> okay. Um, I uh, I don't the, the the problem with stock fonts is they were created to look right at a certain height, but oftentimes you don't know what that height is. So um, the push and pull can be affected quite a bit. So there are a couple fonts out there that probably do look good um, for small lettering. I just don't do it because I have more control. Okay. And when we're using the thinner thread, do you use the same bobbin color as the thread? Um, I've never changed the bobbin color. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I only adjust the, um, the tension so the bobbin doesn't show. Okay. Uh, I see a question about topping, but I believe that you talk about that later. So I won't bring that up yet, although uh, the two logos that are on the right were done on fleece, and maybe this would be a good time to talk about um, how to keep, especially the thinner weight threads, from sinking into the nap of any fabric that you're embroidering. Okay, uh, in this case, uh, it's several things can affect it. Density of the stitch, so with fleece you want a higher density, lower space between the letters. Um, you'll want a higher pull compensation. Um, with thin strokes like this, you probably can't adjust the underlay too much, but with thicker strokes, you want more underlay, say a zigzag or a double zigzag, um, and that'll help build it, build the top stitching up so it looks nice and bold and doesn't sink in. And then finally, there's a water soluble topping that can really make a difference too. It's a little bit of work to get it out because you have to like steam it and everything, but it, it really does improve the job. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.
Um, actually, before, sorry, I'm sorry I keep interrupting. I'm reading the questions as we go along. Um, there have been a couple about the handouts. You mentioned one uh, we did. I believe that we didn't mention at the beginning that um, everybody on their screen should have a, a kind of a sidebar where handouts are available. But um, rest assured that at the end of this, we'll be sending follow-up emails to everyone with links to um, a a recorded version of the webinar, a printable version, and the handouts that Jesse's referring to. So no worries. Sorry, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, readout versus separate colors. Um, issue, the, the positives with a readout is going to be um, fewer stitches. The negative can be, it can lose its shape. It's harder to control the shape because like on the left you can kind of see the lines you have to kind of direct your stitch direction a little bit differently because um, you're not having those lines showing on the right is um, separate colors you've got the thin lines circle lines being the color of the fabric um, the negative on this can be that you have to um, change thread colors depending on um, multiple colors of garments, um, which takes time, and also uh, more stitches, obviously, but it does get a cleaner look. Jesse, a question about caps. What would you do about uh, lettering that um the term they're using is dives or kind of drops into the seam of a, like a six panel cap. Um, uh, in that case, um, is that an underlay one? I tend, well, it's not really an underlay thing, but you, you can adjust the underlay for that spot, but you also kind of, um, want to, kind of start a little, if possible, a little outside of that seam. Um, because right at that seam, if you start right in the middle, you can have an issue of it not catching the bobbin and stuff. So, um, but yeah, pretty much um, instead of doing a whole lot more underlay in that section, I would probably just try to adjust the pull compensation to a little wider, a little out there more or um, actually just physically adjust the stroke that's sinking. Um, the problem with doing any kind of adjustment for something like that is you don't always have that hat hoop perfectly every single time. So if you do make an adjustment, it's going to look just look fatter if it doesn't hit that seam. So um, it's just kind of a problem. Um, if possible, I would recommend be moving the lettering over a little or something like that so it's not quite directly in the center, if that's a possibility. OK, thank you. OK, um, performance wear. Performance wear is very stretchy. Um, it can often have basically stretched to twice the width i mean uh, of its normal you can kind of if you have a three inch fabric you can stretch it to six inches so uh even when hooped uh, correctly it can um, stretch out and um there's n not a whole lot of solutions but you can use weblon backing helps a, I, i've seen an improvement using a couple layers of weblon um, the other is I recommend just a little bit less density um, overall and also if not recommending really complicated logos um, uh, on the in the panel here you see the hot rod chrome and that has very little stretching and that's good um, if you have too thick of satin stitch um, say like a quarter inch or wider um, be aware that satin stitch can really pucker the fabric if it gets too wide and no matter what underlay you use it's going to pucker 
So uh, just keep things like that in mind. Try to uh, steer away from performance if you can, if the logo is very large or just very complicated. The simpler, like a few words and stuff, the better. And here you see the puckering I was talking about. Um, it just, like on the left, it shows it completely out of whack and everything. Um, lithia has an issue with looking straight. And um, I can guarantee you with this, um, this embroidery that when it was hooped, it looked straight. It didn't pucker. But once you unhooped it, hmm all the puckering happened and everything. But um, but if you properly hoop it, it's going to give you a better chance. And to properly hoop performance wear, it takes a little more than me just verbally saying, but pretty much just flatten out the fabric on top of that back hoop so it's straight and not stretched. And then press the top hoop from the top using both hands and just slowly press at the same time, trying not to stretch at all. Um, you basically want the fabric to be tight but not stretched. And um, if it's properly hooped, if you push your finger on that fabric inside the hoop, it shouldn't push the fabric around a whole lot. It should just barely make a little ripple. And ah yes, um, hoop too large. That this this is another good example. Um, the larger the hoop, like if the hoop is too big compared to the logo, you're going to have a much larger chance of the fabric stretching. Um, on the right, it shows most likely a, a size 12 hoop here. Um, and on the left is a size 15, I believe. And um, in this case, the, the wider the area from the logo, the more chance of that fabric being stretched around. Also, it's just the larger the hoop, the harder to hoop for performance. Jesse, is there a, a stabilizer or backing that you recommend for um, embroidery on performance wear? Yeah, I, I did recommend Weblon. Uh, um, I, I have tried it and I like it. Uh, if you don't have Web, Weblon, you can use uh, it, it. Pretty much you're stuck with um, Cutaway. Do not use Tearaway. Um, but but Cutaway just can't stabilize it quite as well as Weblon. And I use two layers of Weblon typically. Okay, thank you. Jesse, what, what are your thoughts on um, using a magnetic hoop for performance wear? Um, I've never used it, so I honestly don't know. Um, I've heard nothing but good things about magnetic hoop, hoops, but um, I, I have not tried, so I really can't tell you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to give you a little break now while, while I just address um, some of the uh, one of the trends that we see in embroidered logos these days is coming in the form of specialty threads. And specialty threads, um, several manufacturers of them uh, basically came onto the market as problem solvers. Uh, you see the, uh, Jesse talk quite a bit about 60 weight. Um, some of us have now 75 weight because the more verbose that some companies get, uh, the more necessary it is to be able to embroider uh, strings of letters and words in very small types. So the 60 weight and the 75 weight came on the market for um, to solve that problem. And again, manufacturers can suggest needles. Like Jesse said, I think the 65.9 needle is recommended for use with 60 weight thread. But um, there's there are tutorials that we can make available to you um, afterwards um, to go into some of the details. Metallic threads uh, for emphasis or for 
kind of a unique quality if a customer comes in just wanting to look uh, different from the rest of the crowd. Uh, we showed an example of the Silver Spoon Cafe. We did this logo, I think, for a trade show. We did it using gray uh, thread, and we used it uh, putting in some silver metallic to show. Kind of gives pizzazz to the whole thing and um, actually enables embroiders to charge a little bit more for the accomplishment of that. But it is a thread that... Um, I think some embroiders are cautious about. Uh, there is a 50 weight thread that, to my knowledge, is the thinnest um, metallic thread. It will run um, as long as your uh, tension is set correctly. It should run the same as a 40 weight regular rayon or polyester thread. Um, it doesn't require any change in the needle, and that is a 50 weight thread, 50 weight metallic. Um, a matte finish thread that we offer is unique in that, actually in several uh, ways, it is used for shading when it's combined with uh, the shine of polyester or the luster of classic rayon. Um, it is particularly um, uh, strong and color fast when held up to uh, sunlight. So for something like umbrellas, patio cushions, boat covers, it's a thread that is particularly useful outdoors. And the colors, even though it is a matte finish without any shine, are very, very vivid. Uh, we, we refer to them as high definition colors. They, they really stand out. And um, this base jump that you see is uh, the matte finish thread in the background with a metallic thread um, for base jump. So it shows the difference and gives kind of a three dimensionality uh, to that. There's also threads like um, firefighter thread that was de designed for safety. Um, if you're dealing with any uh, local fire or first responders or emergency vehicles, um, also some industries would require a fire resistant thread. Uh, there's a wool and a cotton blend thread. If the logo that you're after would benefit from looking hand embroidered, those are threads that were designed for that, for that rustic hand embroidered look. So um, if you have any uh, curiosity, creativity, and a little bit of time on your hands, some of these uh, specialty threads are worth giving a try, um, again, for problem solvers, but also to lend a really unique look to the logos that you're producing. Okay. Um... 3D or puff embroidery. Um, puff embroidery is created by using foam to get that height. And uh, it's basically made by, like, if you have any flat stitching first, you embroider that, and then you do a run stitch to kind of show the outline of the where the puff goes and tell the machine to stop and once the machine stops that's where you put the foam and then do the top stitching top stitching pretty much has to be satin uh, if you do fill stitch it's going to flatten the puff and not look raised at all so um, but like i talked earlier satin stitch has limitations if you go too wide it's going to um, just cut between points the, the machine is going to automatically trim it's it's not going to think of it as a stitch to stitch it's just going to think of as cuts so um, on the right you see uh, as CA Arizona and California the the AZ and the CA are a good example of kind of the width you want to use for puff you get too detailed um, and have two two small of areas like opens of hole, uh, holes such as like the inside of the A. If it's too small and everything, you can't pull, pull that foam out after you're done embroidering. So you do want it kind of bold and simple, but not too wide. And um, I I don't really like to go into like what the width is for the max because every machine is different. Um, Tajima has a little bit longer width than um, other machines I'm familiar with, but um, it's something you need to experiment 
with if 3D Puff is a, if it's the first time you're doing 3D, um, I highly recommend giving yourself a couple extra days just to work out the kinks. Don't ever do um, first time 3D as a rush. You'll just be pulling your hair out. <laughs> Um, Jesse, just uh, a question or two dealing with the, the puff. Um, and this question, I think, would be a great answer for the person that asked how you get the foam to be the exact shape of the embroidery. Could you explain just very, very briefly how um, the excess foam is removed? Um, yeah, uh, first, I, I failed to mention that, like, um, if you look on the right, you, you see the A in... Um, it's flat on the bottom there. Um, basically, the density cuts the foam, and you're doing double density of normal um, satin stitch. And uh, since you're relying on the density to cut the foam, you also have to, in those flat areas, have stitching that's like underlay, but it's just exactly satin stitch going the opposite direction cutting that bottom part of the thread, uh, of the foam, excuse me. Um, and it's uh, to pull it off once you're done with the embroidery to remove that foam. You might want to use a heat gun to shrink the foam just a little bit. It just eases things off and it just peels away. Um, you might have to poke in a few areas where foam pokes, pokes out, just use a needle and press it in, but it's, Really, it's the stitches that cut the foam, and um, if done correctly, will come out pretty easily as long as you know it's not too intricate. Jesse, do you, what did um, do you do at the ends? Do you cap the ends in order to cut the the foam at that part? Yeah, that, that's what I was talking about. That kind, of, it's kind of like an underlay. It's it's called capping, but um, it's just going the opposite direction. Uh, before you put that top stitching. So um, it just, like in the A, it just go, it'll be a vertical stitch um, that cuts the bottom part of the foam, and then you do the top stitching um, of a normal satin as it goes around the A. But And one, one question that, that I could explain it. Yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, one question that I could answer easily, does Madeira sell foam for creating 3D embroidery? Yes, we do. And uh, what height? Three mil, mil uh, somethings. <laughs> Three millimeter, and do you do millimeter. offer six millimeter also? No, we don't. Two. We offer two, Okay. and we have something called Bodybuilder. Yeah which is a, a kind of a stiffer um, foam. Okay. Oh, the, the stiff foam really works well. I, I've tried the stiffer foam and I really like that. Um, three millimeter is basically the average, the, the one that you'd most commonly see. Okay. So uh, in conclusion, uh, I recommend uh, talk to you when they present a logo, kind of look over the logo, um, talk to your customer about possible changes. Um, if you're not real sure about what changes those are going to be, just say like, I need to show it to my uh, digitizer um, and we'll talk over what works and what doesn't. Um, also, be aware of placement because placement dictates size oftentimes so um, make sure the logo works in that spot before saying yes know your embroiderers capabilities this includes um, uh, hoop sizes they have uh, the thread weight if they're limited to 40 or also have 60 or 75 and um, uh, color. Color can be limited. It also can be limited by um, the machines. So some some have 15. I mean, that's kind of the average, but some may only have nine colors available. So that will also change how you digitize and how you plan for a logo. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Jesse, that was a lot of information. Uh, we have a lot of questions here also, and we're going to end here on our last slide. Um, if those attending can just stay with me for two more minutes. Um, I want to point out that Jesse spoke today about the concerns of digitizers and embroiders um, and what's needed in order to please their customer to get the job done. So again, since we are really kind of talking in the blind here to uh, an audience, we're not sure of the abilities of each one of you. So see how comfortable you are with the concerns and the advice that Jesse shared um, in order to decide if you're going to digitize yourself or send it out to a digitizer with more experience. Um, but these certainly are some things that you can expect to see walking in the door. Um, in any case, we hope you've learned a lot today in terms of what to look for and what's needed to translate a graphic logo to an embroidered one with beautiful results. Uh, as a reminder, we have collected all of your questions today and we will be working to answer them all um, and send you a link to the complete questions and answers. Um, we will also include a link to our specials. You see them here from Adir USA and from Ignition Drawing. Um, we'll send a link to the recorded version of the webinar. That was a question that came in regularly, as well as a printable one in case you'd like to print out the slides and have them um, at your disposal. Uh, the email will include the specials as well as a link to Madeira USA, Ignition Drawing, in either case, um, and just in case either one of us may help you in any way. Again, thank you so much for attending, and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Thank you, Jesse. You're welcome.